This is Regenerative Skills, the podcast helping you to learn the skills and solutions to create an abundant and connected future. I'm your host, Oliver Gaucher. Are you left wanting more at the end of each episode of this show? Are these short sessions getting you fired up to try new skills for yourself and share the journey with others who are working through the same challenges? Well, the good news is that this podcast is only the beginning. The real action and learning is happening on the Regenerative Skills Discord channel, where you can connect with the whole community to dive deeper into the topics on the show, explore solutions, and share your journey and blooper reel with an active group that can't wait to hear from you. You can get your questions answered and share knowledge and wisdom of your own on a safe platform that, unlike the social media giants, won't steal your personal data to advertise to you in creepy ways. Ditch Facebook and join us where the real skill builders are. Just find the link to the Discord chat on the homepage at regenerativeskills.com. Hey everybody and welcome back. So I'm really lucky that I've been collaborating with book publishers since the early days of this podcast. It gives me access to all of the books from the authors that I interview and the full catalogs of most of the publishers too. And as a result, I have a pretty good overview of the new literature that comes out on the topics that I focus on in this podcast. Under these conditions, it's rare that a single book stands out so much in my mind for the quality and the importance of the ideas in it and for the practical examples that illustrate those concepts in ways that someone can actually put into action. For me, though, that book is Beyond the War on Invasive Species by Dow Orion. Now, perhaps I really connected with it because of my work in the Conservation Corps and the collaborations with the U.S. Forest Service and the National Park Service on those jobs. The fight against invasives in those circles was very present and left an impression on me in my early career. The idea of fighting against the propagation and the spread of a plant or an animal never really sat well with me, though, But I didn't have a way of expressing my unease until I read this book. The worldview and the perspective on our roles as earth stewards that Dow outlines continues to inform so much of my work and my experience on my own land. And so let's get into it. Dow Orion is the author of Beyond the War on Invasive Species, a permaculture approach to ecosystem restoration, and People as Purposeful and Conscientious Resource Stewards, Human Agency in a World Gone Wild, and also Rethinking Wilderness and the Wild, Conflict, Conservation, and Coexistence. Dow consults on holistic farm, forest, and restoration planning through her company Resilience Permaculture Design, LLC, and works as an instructor in the Oregon State University Permaculture Program. She holds a degree in agroecology and sustainable agriculture from UC Santa Cruz, and a Master's of Science in Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security from the National University of Ireland. She lives with her husband, two children, and an array of fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and animals on their southern Willamette Valley small holding, Viriditas Farm. In this interview, Dow and I dig through the ideas and the examples in her first book, from the origins of the concept of invasive species, through to the government policies that wage war on them in modern times. We look at how species migration has accelerated with human travel technologies, and how their spread has mirrored the spread of global trade. Dow describes the paradoxes of demonizing opportunistic and displaced species and gives examples of how we can begin to look deeper into the reasons, the conditions, and the needs that bring about their proliferation to gain insight on how we might look beyond eradication to collaboration in their management. We also talk about some of the tangible examples that I'm dealing with right now on my farm and my local area in an attempt to uncover the hidden potential of the species that the authorities around me are working to control. I know I recommend a lot of books on this show, and for good reason. I stand by all of those recommendations. But if there's one volume that you should really take time to understand and internalize in your way of observing and understanding the fast-changing natural world around us, it's this one. And so I'll hand things over now to Dow Orion. So welcome, Dow. It's wonderful to finally get to connect with you over a call. I have admired your book and your work for some time now. How are you doing? Where where am I finding you right now? Thanks. It's great to be here. I'm doing well. I live just south of Eugene, Oregon, at the kind of headwaters of the Willamette River. It's snowing outside, which is kind of unusual for this time of year, but we're rolling with it. <laughs> That's wild. I really wish that I had known more about you and your your book when I lived in that area. I used to live in Portland for a while. 
I did oh, cool. an apprenticeship with the Cobb Cottage Company and have oh. kind of bumped shoulders with a lot of people from the Aprovecho Institute, even though you've now oh. changed your name. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been involved with Aprovecho since 2006. So and it's still I'm on the board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just missed each other. But anyway, uh, I would really like to focus on a subject that you have explored extensively in your book, Beyond the War on Invasive Species, and use that as an avenue to open up other subjects around land management, uh, agroecology, and so many of the other sectors that you've worked in. Let's, let's start there. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, uh, I mean, I kind of got my start in all of this kind of world of restoration by being interested in agroecology and organic agriculture. That's what I studied at the university many years ago and kind of took that knowledge into being more interested in permaculture and kind of whole systems approaches to land management and land regeneration. And when I had the opportunity to get involved in ecological restoration, I thought, you know, it would be a, a way to kind of learn my native plants better and just kind of develop a new skill set. And when I got a job uh, working as a botanist, actually, at a local kind of wetland restoration area, I was really surprised to learn the extent to which people relied on herbicide to manage their restoration projects. I, as an organic farmer, I had never really um, come into contact with that. And I was really shocked. And it just seemed so blasé and, you know, just kind of, that's what everybody did. And so I felt like it was really important to kind of be able to offer a, an alternative viewpoint on <clears throat> how to manage or approach the whole idea of invasive species and, you know, kind of zoomed out from that, like, what are we trying to achieve with our land stewardship and rest, ecological restoration in general from a more holistic perspective? And in the research for your book, did you uncover how this concept this idea of invasive species actually began? Well, it was definitely fueled by chemical company interests. I think that, you know, there are many people involved in land management, you know, and even 20, 30 years ago who were noticing this trend of increased presence of what are called invasive species, and they were worried about it. And, but that kind of coincided with at least what some of my research uncovered, Monsanto, you know, which is often demonized, but it is actually true in this case, there were, they were kind of seeking to expand their market. And, you know, from forestry, which is really, you know, a big industry around here. And there a lot of the kind of documents were from Oregon and talking about brush management. And at the time, a lot of what they were managing with herbicide were native plants that were coming back in clear cuts and things like that. But they were realizing that they could kind of get a leg up with some of this concern around increasing numbers of invasive species. And so they did. They actually had an employee on the board of the California Invasive Plant Council and kind of shaped the trajectory, I would say, of how the whole conversation is approached. Yeah, it's wild how industrial interests have played such a role in even the wording that we use for different biological members of our ecological communities and have painted a real perspective on how we deal with them and how we classify them. And I think in your book, you did a fantastic job of explaining how species, both plants and animals and otherwise, have been moving around the globe since the very beginning. Now, there have been a lot of human influences that have changed the traditional migration patterns and the movements that we would normally see in non-human uh, ecologies. But, you know, this is a natural part of succession and expansion of territory that has been going on from the beginning of our first time. Tell me about some of the ways that human interaction, especially since colonial exploration and moving around has become much easier and cheaper, how this has interrupted some of the natural cycles of how this would normally develop. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, species have been, as you mentioned, moving around, you know, and changing, evolving since you know, life began on the planet. 
Um, that's kind of how we all emerged here. But definitely since, you know, colonization and the kind of dawn of major global shipping and travel and fast travel, and especially, you know, agricultural expansion, there's been, you know, kind of shipping of animals and plants. And, you know, that's definitely accelerated. But even before that, you know, there's evidence that indigenous folks prior to colonization moved plants from Southeast Asia to South America. And, you know, like the mulberry, you know, spread up into Central America and Mexico. So there's, you know, evidence that, you know, when people found usefulness in certain plants, they uh, took them with them when they explored and moved around as well. It's just definitely been facilitated more rapidly recently, but also the scale of land use change and land degradation has also accelerated. So they've kind of, you know, <laughs> grown together, I would say. And you definitely can't separate invasive species presence from the style and rate of land use change that we've experienced. Yeah, and another thing that really stood out to me that I hadn't been aware of before reading this book is just how confusing of a way that the title of invasives is determined in different places or even what species are protected, right? I mean, perfect examples of non-native crops that are grown in monocultures all around the world. And those are not considered invasive, although they have probably taken over more land area than many of the ones that we actively try and eradicate or the different classifications and maybe even different areas of the same country where in this area it's considered invasive and in the other area it is protected. And you've given great examples of that in the book. Talk to mm -hmm. me about how it was to navigate even the definitions in the United States, much less in other parts of the world when you were writing the book. Yeah, that was a really interesting kind of rabbit hole that I went down because I was really thinking about the word invasive and whether you know, I should use it or propose another term. But I was really trying to seek out where that phrase came from and how it's defined, like if, if there could be an actual definition in the scientific literature or elsewhere. And what I finally found, at least, you know, that the U.S. government uses, which was actually kind of predetermined by the Cal California IPC that I mentioned the Monsanto employee was on, they kind of set the framework for this which has since been adopted in elsewhere outside of the U.S., is that an invasive species is one that causes, you know, one of the definitions. It's like a 15-page document of a definition. It's not like a paragraph. It's very <laughs> subjective, and there's all these different, you know, conditions for it. But one of the definitions is that it creates economic harm. And that was something that I felt was very interesting and highly subjective because, as you mentioned, you know, there's species like wheat and corn that, you know, and soy, like those three crops, at least in the United States and even globally, but I'm more familiar with the statistics here, cover almost 300 million acres of land, three species. And if you think about it from that perspective, you know, we're changing and protecting, you know, we're changing the land and protecting the viability of those species to thrive because of our economic context. And, you know, yes, they're important food crops, but the way that they're produced doesn't lead to good ecological outcomes in many cases. And so, and yet we're highly focused on eradicating species that don't even touch that, that amount of acreage. And, you know, to me, that seems strange because I kind of think about if we're talking about restoring ecosystems, we need to be looking at the bigger picture of, you know, what's really affecting the functionality and diversity of land, of you know, intact ecosystems. And to a large degree, it's agriculture, forestry, urban development, mining, you know, dam, damming rivers. So, and we, we think of those as necessary economic activities, but they're changing the landscape. And so, you know, I think being able to you know, kind of be mature, responsible adults and realize that those decisions are leading to ecological outcomes that we don't like is kind of the first step. <laughs> we can accept that 
and, you know, kind of think about it from a different perspective, that if we don't want the ecological outcomes that we're seeing, we're going to need to address the bigger picture issues associated with how those products are produced and how we, you know, manage the land where they're grown. Um, and, you know, kind of remove the the focus of ecological degradation from invasives because they're not causing the problem. We're causing the problem by the way that we manage land, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And having a definition that is pegged to this concept of doing economic damage is a very, very slippery way of classifying something as invasive or not or good or bad and we start to put binary labels on things that do not reflect what presumably we are trying to do when combating or even managing certain species it completely decouples it from the health of the ecology that we're working with and turns it into this abstract concept of well who's economically damaged by these things and that influences much about how it is legislated and the types of, well, in some cases, the products, like you mentioned, the herbicides and whatnot, are permitted to be used against it. And another thing that has has really stood out to me in, in all of this is the difference between invasive and naturalized species and the fuzzy or almost non-existent line between those two things. Can you talk about some of the learnings about the distinctions there? And when the cutoff for something being invasive or when it's considered naturalized might or might not be? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I feel like, you know, I mean, there was a period or probably at least in the U.S. around the, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, where, you know, there was like the world's fair and people were like bringing species to show. And, you know, like Japanese knotweed was first introduced there and, you know brought in, there was like a period of excitement around these kind of species. And a lot of those kind of agricultural, like weed species that are now considered naturalized, some of them, especially like the pasture, pasture grasses and, and species that came in and hay and stuff like that, were kind of just like, you know, they're considered now more or less part of the ecosystem, even though they're not native. But then there's other ones that you know, many of which I think directly interfere with more, especially around here, like forestry enterprises, like Scotch broom is an invasive that is, you know, heavily <laughs> sprayed and, and managed in forest ecosystems because it's hard to deal with in active forest management areas. So it's not just one that is kind of, you know, you can just let the cows out and graze it. Because you've already changed the land use with some of these naturalized species, we just kind of accept them. But there's invasives that are still like causing issues for those bigger economic interests, and so they're they're treated differently. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> it really is, yeah. And it makes me think about how, with these slippery definitions and very subjective interpretations of them, how these are going to be used in the future to the convenience of, let's say, political bodies or economic interests because they can be manipulated so much. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's an interesting point. I think, you know, one of the things that I really try to bring forward, you know, as I have talked about this and, you know, met with people and done implementation projects and, and things that I think it's important that we stay consistent with our message that we're really trying to regenerate land and that should be our focus and so you know invasive species management may come as a result of that because I'm definitely you know I plant a lot of native species I do like active restoration projects I don't use herbicide but I there is value in maintaining native ecosystems and I think you know I would like to you know make sure that we're all on the same page about that and just, you know, be thinking about how, you know, people in the conservation science world and people in the kind of permaculture world, like where we all want the same thing. We may just be going about it from a different perspective, but I think it's important that we're united, especially as things like this become potentially more 
you know, geared towards economic interests and it's, it's harder to like stake your, <laughs> your, your claim or your, your kind of position and where you're coming from. Absolutely. And maybe we should take a step back further here for a second before we explore some alternative ways of managing these species and talk about from your experience, how, I guess, in the United States and in other places, invasive species are currently managed or attempted to be eradicated. You mentioned already the very prevalent use of chemicals that are common in agriculture, herbicides and others. Both in your experience and in your research, what does it mean <laughs> to manage conventionally an invasive species? Well, I mean, I think that it's kind of like conventional agriculture and that they see pests, you know, quote unquote, as problems to be removed. And if you can just remove them quickly, the problem will go away. And from an ecological perspective, I think we all know that that's not how nature works. Like species show up at a particular time and place because the conditions are suitable for them. Like that's how, you know, evolution works and ecology, you know, is, is it's kind of like a, an open system for particular actors that have certain characteristics to fulfill at a certain time. So, you know, spraying things doesn't make the, the conditions change unless, you know, you can do it a lot and then you have to do it kind of in perpetuity. And one of the things that I'm really interested in and kind of delved into in the book is ecological succession and kind of the role that most invasives play in that kind of process of ecosystem development and, you know, nutrient accumulation and, you know, organic matter building in soils and things like that. There's, there's a lot that these species are doing for an ecosystem. And I think if we can understand that piece we can understand how to maybe approach the management better <laughs> in a more holistic way, because we need to kind of understand their function and role in an ecosystem and not just assume that they're bad actors, because there's a reason that they're showing up when they do. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the biggest takeaways I got from the book. So let's dig into that even deeper, because like you're talking about the ecological succession, many of the species that we have labeled as invasive are performing an ecological role where either a native species has not been able to do fast enough or quickly enough based on how quickly we're doing the degradation or simply does not exist or did not exist previously to fill that niche, either in a repair role, like you said, some of them are bioaccumulators or, or help to accumulate fertility. Some of them might have root systems that resist or break up compaction or even hold soil in place to resist erosion and other services. And a lot of this comes as a response to ecological damage that is done through our actions, through our land management systems as they currently are. And our you know, early stage successional species that if they were allowed to perform their role, would bow out naturally once that role was completed. And well, maybe go a little further and deeper into there. This is a summary of my, <laughs> my understanding. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. I think, you know, <clears throat> many of the species that are considered invasive are ones that are very short-lived and, you know, they, they won't stick around an ecosystem very long if left to kind of their own devices unless the disturbance continues. So like tillage or herbicide, if you're kind of, you know, exposing the soil again and again and again, you're going to keep getting the same results. It's like the definition of insanity, right? Like you just keep trying the same thing over again. And you're the very, the very disturbance <laughs> that we are then using to try and manage yeah. them, which puts the ecosystem further back and makes the conditions yeah. even more attractive for proliferation of those rather than ones that we say we're actually trying to favor. Exactly. It's, you know, if you think about ecological succession as, you know, after a natural disturbance, like a volcano or a landslide or something, there's, you know, kind of bare soil. And the first species that come there are the, quote, pioneer species, and they have certain characteristics, like they have, you know, rhizomatous root systems, they might have a lot of 
flowers or seeds that attract other wildlife to bring in seeds from nearby areas to start, you know, bringing in the next layer of succession, like the shrub layer in many ecosystems. And then trees, you know, can come in and germinate in the mulch and shade that these other species provide. That the the kinds of species that we're often dealing with are ones that exist in that kind of primary or pioneer successional layer. And, you know, if we are thinking about, one of the things I also like to talk to people about is we really need to think about the goal of like what type of ecosystem characteristics we're wanting, because having an old growth, you know, closed canopy forest is one trajectory. Having kind of an open savanna like characteristic grassland with wildflowers and things like that is another trajectory that requires more consistent disturbance of some kind. In my case, and probably in Spain too, historically, fire and grazing are the things that keep that type of ecosystem where it is at that kind of intermediate level of succession with some big trees, but mostly annual and perennial grasses and, and forbs. So we have to kind of know what we'd like, and then we can kind of plan the management towards that and think about the species that we'd like to be there that kind of make up that ecosystem and creating the conditions that they thrive in. And invasive species that might be present at any time can tell us what the ecosystem itself, what the soil quality is like. We can use that information to kind of nudge things in a different direction towards that, that ecological goal that we've identified. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to get into in, in a minute about how each one of these species can serve as an indicator that can give us insights into the relationship required to co-evolve with them. And like you said, clearly defining the objectives of what you're trying to manage for is essential in understanding how you might end up getting there. And also what role said invasive species might play in the acceleration of the successional uh, evolution towards reaching a homeostasis that, you know, it could be a grassland, it could be a closed canopy, mature forest, and it could be some sort of mix of savanna lands, much like we have in the Deesa systems in the Iberian Peninsula. And each one requires certain elements to be present and adaptive and intuitive, probably cultural management beyond just, you know, uh, sanctioned interventions, but uh, an actual relationship with the populations around them in order to reach that kind of balance and resilience that we might say that we want when we set out on a new management trajectory. Exactly. I mean, I think here in the States, you know, and I think it's similar in Spain and Portugal from what I, my understanding is with the the Dehesa Savannah management system, it's very much a cultural ecosystem. And it, people are a part of, of kind of creating and maintaining the, the mosaic and the, the level of succession that is there um, and has been kind of maintained over thousands of years. In the same way in Oregon and uh, you know many other parts of the United States, indigenous folks managed mostly Savannah type ecosystems using fire and kind of managed grazing of wild ungulates like elk and bison and deer even, you know, their herds were managed in different ways than domesticated livestock. But th those effects of fire and grazing maintained ecosystems at a certain level of succession, certain plant communities. And, you know, at the advent of colonization here, taking that management away made the ecosystem trajectory totally changed. There were all kinds of different niches available for different species. At the same time, we kind of layered in the introduction of European animals, pigs, cows, sheep, also changed how the ecosystem functioned and looked. So there were many different elements kind of going on that contribute to the landscape that we see in the States today. But a big one was kind of prohibition of cultural management and removal of indigenous folks from their traditional land management and land, <laughs> you know, in terms of ownership and, or just being able to be on their land. Definitely. I'm glad you used earlier the example of the Deesa system. I happen to have some very close friends and colleagues 
who manage the Portuguese version, which is called Montado. And mm -hmm. I mean, watching the evolution of that place, as well as the evolution of their understanding of what their management is, their role as conductors of the orchestra, so to speak, is really yes. not only beautiful to watch, but to, to participate in. I've had the good mm -hmm. fortune of seeing them introduce new species and grow in their understanding of how to work with diversity. But I guess the point that I wanted to talk about here is how protection or even designation of protected species can have a detrimental effect. And this being the perfect example, the cork and home oaks that are emblematic of that ecosystem now being protected in Portugal have started to have an opposite result. Because you need to request permission to cut down or even to prune any of those trees. Mm -hmm. And those permits are not easy to get and sometimes very costly, at least the process, if not the permits themselves. The opposite result has been happening in which people no longer plant those trees because they know they won't be able to get rid of them once they're established and once they're cataloged. And so what mm -hmm. instead you're starting to see more and more of is all these trees of a certain age group, right around when the regulation started to kick in, and this could be somewhere between 80 to 300 years old, many of them starting to reach senescence because of poor management practices in the pasture land and a lack of rotation of animals as is appropriate. And because they're protected and you can't intervene on them later, they're not allowing natural regrowth and they're certainly not replanting because they know they won't be able to either prune or get rid of them as is necessary to open up the canopy to allow more pasture to grow. And so you're actually defavoring the very thing you're trying to protect through restricted yeah. processes that don't allow for, uh, basically it, it is a way of disrespecting the land managers and saying that you have no real good insight or way of managing this and we need to come in and baby you and tell you how to do it. And therefore, you know, you're, you're defavoring the very thing you're trying to protect. So I would imagine, so you've seen this from the perspective of pure eradication, things that are labeled as invasive species, but then you also have this twisted roundabout with protecting them and getting the opposite result. Have you seen any of that with these best intention practices as well? Yeah, I think, you know, there's this idea and I, I my sense is that it maybe started with the like wilderness myth in the mm -hmm. United States. I mean, I just see it very intensely in the whole conservation world here that nature is static and pristine. And the best thing that we can do is to kind of fence it off and close it and keep people out because, you know, we mess things up. And, you know, <laughs> there's no doubt that we do in certain contexts or at least, you know, capitalist colonial interests mess things up. But people in general actually you know, have long traditions of stewardship on land and, you know, who have coexisted not in a resource extraction and money making kind of way, but a kind of reciprocal way for thousands of years. I mean, that's how we made it on the planet, whether we're from Northern Europe or the Americas or Australia, like all of the indigenous traditions there are based in you know, reciprocal management of natural resources. And so kind of understanding that we can have a role like that in an ecosystem, I think is kind of new to at least Western science or what it what it's kind of its context today. And I think that's starting to change, but it's still very much, you know, a paradigm that's that's present. And I think, you know, I think things do need to be protected from over exploitation and just turning in land into money. You know, there's no doubt about that. But if we can have a, a different kind of relationship, then we can do a lot. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up because that was a real turning point for me when I had a good friend who I think articulated it also very well in that the hidden assumptions in the conservation narrative are that humans are only capable of having a negative impact on the places that they inhabit and that they interact with. And the second assumed narrative in that is that if you protect one space, that the other spaces are then free to exploit, right? And that gives us carte blanche to do any number of horrendous exploitative things 
in areas that don't fall under the kind of aesthetic beauty categorization or this concept of wilderness that is completely false and allows us, yeah, exactly to disrespect those places because they're not protected. And mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, this is very entrenched as a narrative. It's something that is quite emblematic of, like we said, the, the conservation, let's say community, but is also bled into other kinds of ecological protection. This is very much behind the narrative of the invasive species, like we keep coming back to, and the protection, which, which is how it gets twisted. And I guess that brings me to the second part of this, which I'm really excited to explore with you, which is how do we start to observe and interact and build relationships with these species in a way that gives us insights into how to collaborate with them towards the objectives that we may want. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, I like to make kind of a basic list of characteristics from like a purely observational point of view. And, you know, it's like in permaculture, we talk about spending a year of observation before making any design decisions. And I think, you know, if you're wondering about a particular plant, you know, spend a year observing it as it grows, you know, what are its habits, what pollinators come to visit it, are there mammals coming to feed on the seeds, what happens to the leaf litter, you know, kind of watch it through its life cycle, how deep are the roots, you know, dig one up, check it out, you know, is it a nitrogen fixer? Many of them are. And so kind of learning about the the soil conditioning characteristics that the plant may have. I have an interesting story that a person after a, one of my talks that I gave came up and shared with me that kind of illustrates this. She lived in Northern California and she had a farm there. Then, you know, she started like back to land in the seventies. She had like a 40 acre chunk and there was like a back 10 acres that she could just never really manage on her own. And so she just left it when she got there in the seventies, it was totally Canada thistle, you know, one invasive species that's really common around here. After 10 years, of just being like solid Canada thistle, it, the scotch broom came up and it was pure scotch broom for 30 years. And so I saw her, you know, in like 2017 and she said just in the past year or so, the scotch broom, which, you know, as an individual only lives for like 30 to 35 years, each shrub, they were starting to die. And underneath the scotch broom, she crawled around in there. All of the native forest species were germinating. The bay laurel, the madrone, the pine, and the fir, the oak were all coming up in the deep, dark, rich soil of the scotch broom. And the Canada thistle, the 40 years of their kind of ecological successional trajectory had brought them to this. And, you know, I think in some ways, if we can take the time to observe what's really happening and not kind of be afraid. <laughs> we can understand that there is this kind of potential. You know, that's a that's a long time in a human time frame, lifetime. And so we might want to think about ways of mimicking what some of those species are doing in a shorter time frame to get some of the similar results, but have the more aesthetic preference that many people have around native species or a garden or a farm or whatever it might be. Um, but I always think back to that because, you know, I think there's very little, uh, there are very few examples of people just kind of letting it go and seeing what happens. And there's a lot of fear around, like, it's just going to be like this forever. But if you really think about it, like we were talking about before, these species don't live very long on their own. And if the ground's not disturbed, they're not going to keep coming back. You know, if you dump a bag of scotch broom seed into the old growth redwoods in Northern California, they're not going to grow there. There's not resources there. Everything's bound up in these like old growth um, forest features, you know, the big, the big old trees. So it's a, not the, the right type of ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's really important to understand since many of us have such limited access to observing ecologies in their evolution and in larger spans of time. 
Uh, those of us who either don't own land or move around a lot, you know, it's hard to observe the changes over these periods of time. But, you know, they know what they're doing. Like you said, like these seeds are not going to germinate in unconducive conditions in both directions. You know, if the light conditions, the, the soil conditions are not correct for germination, it's just not going to happen. You can't really force it. I mean, even if you transplant them, they're not going to thrive in those areas. Yeah. And it's also true if you start to try and skip ecological steps and plant climax species in early placenta conditions, yeah. right? So, so, so it goes both ways. But, you know, one thing that I've noticed is that we're pretty much using all examples of plants up until this point. And one of the ones from the book that really resonated with me because I spent almost all my adolescence in Minnesota and then upper Northwest <laughs> is that of the zebra mussel. I think you know where I'm oh, going yeah. with it. And mm -hmm. I remember seeing all the signs around making sure that all the holes of your boats are clean when you move them in between lakes and, you know, very strict monitoring and regulation around this to try and keep our lakes in that area free of the invasive zebra mussel. And well, maybe you can give a summary of that story of first how it came to the Great Lakes region and why it's been so such a hotbed issue to try and control. And yet the observations and the knowledge that you understand about it and the role it's playing in those ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting example. And, you know, when I was researching my book, I was like, I really want to try to prove myself wrong. So I'm going to, like, look at all these really hard cases, you know, of and animals are a little bit more tricky than plants in a lot of cases. But the zebra mussel story, I found really interesting. And, you know, what I found was that, you know, like many ecosystems, the Great Lakes ecosystem was very, has been highly modified, at least, you know, a couple of them <laughs> historically. And there's a lot of industry around them. And, you know, there was the digging of the canal that kind of reversed the flow. I'm not as <laughs> familiar with that area. So I kind of forget what, it, what the name of it is at the, right now. But and you there talking was about the river that goes through Chicago that was reversed to change the, yeah. the sewage flow. Yeah, I think so. But there's just been a lot of modifications that have kind of enabled development and industry, but have also, you know, had significant ecological effects that we not might not be quite aware of or weren't aware of at the time that those decisions were made. Another thing that kind of contributed to, I think, the zebra mussel proliferation is that I think there were eight species of native mussel that used to exist in the Great Lakes ecosystem. And I think by the time the zebra mussels came along, seven of them had been functionally extinct. Um, they may exist elsewhere, but they don't really exist in the lakes anymore, either they're due to overharvesting or to pollution, lack of habitat. And, you know, I think it's in cases like that where something like zebra mussels coming in shouldn't be surprising because they, they fill a role like other mussels do that have been driven to extinction of fil filtering <laughs> their filter feeders. You know, people, you put them in a tank and you can, you know, dump polluted water into them. And within a day, it's completely clear. And in some cases, you know, I think this is considered an issue, like they're, they're doing too much. And, you know, I think that that is a concern in the short term, but I think in the long term, because they do actually accumulate things like lead and cadmium and mercury, which unfortunately, because of pollution, are in the solution of the water. You know, there's there those kind of heavy metals are present. The zebra mussels can actually take those in and bury them as they die in the sediment and keep them out of the <laughs> the kind of area where most biological life is going to be interacting with them. So over time, again, I think that they are going to be shown to be actually beneficial in terms of creating more of a potential for life to thrive in those areas, especially if the pollution piece stops happening. And, you know, one of the reasons that people really don't like them is because they go in on the the pipes that, you know, these big factories and other industries have actually placed, you know, underground that 
put all of their effluent into the lake and the mussels go in and establish on the pipes and make it so that the effluent can't come out. And they have to spend a bunch of money scraping them all off and then they just come back again. So I think that, at least at first, kind of drove the concern about them because, again, it's expensive and it interferes with business as usual. Economic but, motivation, right? Exactly. But I find their story and what they do, you know, if you kind of remove the, you know, kind of furor about them not being native, what they do in an ecosystem to be quite fascinating. And I I think that they are, as filter feeders, you know, they're cleaning the pollution that we're creating. And if we really want to not have them, <laughs> we need to be working on establishing a different type of economic industry scenario on the Great Lakes. That's what I'd really like to see. <laughs> right, right. And you gave some really great examples, especially towards the end of the book, about how the relationship with some of these could be economically profitable as well. How this could be the foundation of some cottage industries and some new ways of managing this so that it actually brings economic benefits to local communities and incentivizes management rather than eradication, which I mean, there's too many examples of how and why that doesn't work. So a new approach needs to be considered. Yeah, I mean, I think with especially species like water hyacinth or giant reed, like there's these species that create this incredible amount of biomass. And they do it in areas that in, you know, those species are aquatic where there's high nutrient and sediment loading, you know, the pollution pieces ongoing. But, you know, if people were actually like harvesting those and making compost and building the soil, we would be kind of working at it from the other end in terms of increasing the buffer, the filtration capacity of the soil surrounding where these species are thriving in the riparian corridor. I mean, that's just one potential example. You know, another example that I talked about was Asian carp, you know, which is a fish that people are really crazy about. And, you know, that could people could think about using those as food and fertilizer and, you know, not really spending much of money electrocuting them, which is kind of the current um, approach. I mean, people do, I think, fish for them as well, but really thinking about them in terms of, well, if it's a problem, let's seek a, a creative solution that's also regenerative and kind of meeting that that inflection point of seeing what they're doing and, you know, thinking about it a few steps beyond so that we can use them creatively to kind of mitigate the problem that they're exposing by their presence. Yeah, I love those examples. And that brings me kind of back to going deeper of the question that we explored before, which is maybe let's look at some practical steps, some advice on how we can build a deeper understanding of the role and the function of these species in relationship with the ecology that inhabits, because we're part of that ecology, and it's necessary to take a more deeper look, a more intuitive observation in order to really uncover how partnering with them, at least to some capacity, might be able to, again, not solve the problem because we can't look at this as a binary thing of there's problems and solutions, but you know, <laughs> where are we trying to get and how can a deeper relationship with these entities help to facilitate that transition? Mm -hmm. I, I've started to kind of call this thing that I, I do when I do like site visits and land walks and just talk to people about this, is starting with what I call forensic ecology. Like what happened here over the past 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, like go back you know, a couple, a few centuries and kind of think about, write it down, the land management. Like what, were there animals here? Were, was there mining here? Did, has it flooded? What, what are kind of some of the bigger picture factors that have influenced what we're seeing today? And I think if you can kind of start to develop that sense about land and its history based on you know, your knowledge of cultural practices, you know, around here, like indigenous burning was made illegal in 1859, the year after Oregon became a state. 
you know, there were forced displacements up until 1855, you know. So if you think about it from an ecological perspective, we're like 170 years into a very much altered successional trajectory of removing that management. And we, if, if you can kind of understand what that means, you know, why we're seeing so much Douglas fir encroachment, why we see things like scotch broom coming in oak savanna type ecosystems that no longer have fire. It just, it all kind of falls into place, I think. So developing that, that eye and that understanding of your place or of other places that you visit is important. And then, you know, really trying to have a more observational relationship with a species that I mentioned before, like making a list of their characteristics. You know, if you're in a particular area, there's probably going to be like maybe up to 10 invasive species. You know, there's not really, they're not, not all of them are everywhere, but you can mm -hmm. kind of start to get to know them in your particular area, know where they show up, know how long they live, what kinds of things might like to eat them. You know, if you start layering in the the animal management piece, which is something that I'm really interested in, you know, to sheep eat them at this particular time and then, you know, reduce their seed proliferation, things like that. You can kind of start to layer in some other observations. But then that the other piece that we talked about, the goal of what you'd like to see there is also important. So like that historical piece and also the kind of future visioning piece layered together kind of can help inform the, the management steps. I love that. And now there's one thought exercise I'd like us to do here so that because this is a concert, this is a controversial topic and I don't want to get accused of making a straw man out of this argument by cherry picking these species that we've talked about so far, which have very clear and apparent ecological benefits and opportunities for partnership. Let's also look at some of the ones that are trickier. And I'm thinking about some of the invasive species in places like Australia and New Zealand that really are, I don't want to say solely responsible, but it definitely contributed to the decimation of some very important species in those regions, if not complete extinction. How do you approach something that is that delicate and hard to manage? Are you talking about like mammal? I'm thinking specifically or... of like cane toads. <laughs> I know you mentioned <laughs> those in the book. And some yeah. of the other animals that were introduced, like rats and rabbits in New Zealand. I've been to both of these places and I've seen examples of this. And I know how much of an emotional charge it even gets from people around there when you bring this up. Right. And so yeah. trying to uh, encourage a different way of looking at this when the, the destruction is so apparent, how do you approach yeah. this delicate situation? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I, I like to say, you know, I'm not opposed to managing invasive species. Like I do that all the time. I'm not, I know there's some people who are like, just let them go. But I definitely know that it's not a feasible option in many cases and you know with mammals and animals in particular it's a much more tricky situation especially in areas where you don't have natural predators and that you know it, well i do talk about the cane toads and that's a particularly interesting example because they were introduced as a potential biological control you know species in australia for sugarcane which again was imported. So, you know, we have the land use change coming in in a, in a major way. And also, you know, displacement of Aboriginal fire management and all the things very similar to what happened in North America. But what they found was that the, the beetles that were affecting sugarcane in Australia lived higher up on the sugarcane than they do in the Caribbean where the cane toads are from. And so, the toads couldn't hop as high up the, the stalks to eat them. And so it was kind of a failure. And then you have these cane toads, which are predatory. I mean, they eat like everything. And so, and they eat, you know, other reptiles, other amphibians, um, birds, <laughs> you know, they kind of run the whole gamut. And they did, you know, several populations experience significant declines as a result of predation by 
cane toads. But one thing that's interesting that happened or that's happening, and it started about 80 years after their reintroduction, is that the blue-tongued skink, which is a native species to Australia, had been feet. And one of the reasons why I should back up cane toads are such an issue is that they have a toxin in their skin. And so things that would try to prey on them would die or, you know, would get very sick and would not try it again. These skinks started eating another invasive plant in Australia called Mother of Millions that has a very similar toxin to the skin of the cane toads. And they developed a tolerance to that. And then they started to be a predator of the cane toads. And so the cane toad population, you know, had the, its exponential curve upwards for decades, which was very concerning. And they did damage ecosystems and, you know, native species. And now there's a predator that can eat them. And that never happened before. <laughs> and so, you know, <clears throat> on the broad time scale, it's inevitable that relationships like that will emerge. I think the hope is that not too much damage will be done in the interim. And, you know, I kind of looked into some other species like the brown tree snake and Guam that drove bird species to be eliminated from that island. But, you know, again, what preceded that was the removal of 95% of the, the forest ecosystem of Guam by it being essentially a bombing range during World War II. And so all of the forest bird species were kind of constrained to this little island. And then the brown tree snake shows up on the scene and drives them to extinction, local extinction on the island. There are populations that exist in other islands around there. But then the birds start to change their behavior. And, you know, they're having never seen a snake before, there is going to be an inflection point of, you know, essentially just being easy prey, but they adapt and they change and they learn to live with predation just as other species have in places where predators are more common. So, you know, there are these kind of bigger processes at work. And that's not to say that, you know, I wouldn't suggest doing other kinds of management. I, you know, I know that there's a big controversy about like dropping, I think it's 1080, which is like a mammalian poison in New Zealand to kill, what are they called? The, I'm forgetting what they're, those little rodents. They're not a rodent, they're a, they're some kind of mammal. That's a big concern, but they're very cute and soft. <laughs> Sorry, I'm blanking on what they're called. Like, yeah, not gerbils or guinea pigs? No, they live in the forest. Yeah, I'm blanking um, on them too. I think I know what you're talking about, though. But, oh, the possum. Oh, yeah, the possum. Bushtail. That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't think widespread poisoning of anything is a good idea. I do think, you know, again, in the New Zealand context, how much native forest has been cleared to make way for sheep. And so, you know, you're constraining species of birds, especially to islands of highly fragmented habitat. And then you introduce predators, which have never been there before. And it becomes a very untenable situation. And so there's there's both the land degradation side and and the invasive species side. And I think that, you know, if we really want to be proactive, we need to be looking at the harder piece, which is, are, are we creating habitat? Are we creating spaces where species can continue to adapt? I mean, we're it's probably not going to be possible to eradicate mammalian predators from New Zealand at this point. And I think, you know, poisoning them is just not the answer. So thinking about how we create landscapes that leave space 
for what is essentially, you know, evolution to take place is, is one way to think about it. Yeah, I really like that. And it is a tricky one. And, you know, that isn't to say that any of these one actions or suggestions are going to work, but it's going to be a co-evolution process as we learn what is effective, what has unintended consequences, and what the ecology adapts to on its own through simple evolutionary progression. Mm -hmm. And I also want to talk about how, you know, we're, we're talking earlier about the objectives and the importance of defining those before you go into particular management tactics, let's say. And the common one that I often hear as a justification for control or eradication of invasive species is an attempt to reestablish or favor native species. Let's talk about what it actually takes and what is a perhaps more empathetic and effective way of accomplishing that if we're going to take eradication or chemical control of invasives off the table. What are some things that we need to be aware of in order to make proper management decisions? And give me some ideas of things that have been effective through your experience. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I like to say, so you if you've decided on your goal, and you have like a suite of native plants that you'd like to be there, really doing some research on what they require to thrive. And some of them really like herbivory. Some of them really like fire. Some of them really like to be dug up and propagated. Like in my area here, you know, many of the native wildflower, quote, wildflowers are food crops. And, you know, by digging them up, you actually increase their their propagules and by not interacting with them and just leaving them there, they actually shrink in population over time. So there's, you know, that question of what do the native species need to thrive should be first, or, you know, should be a layer in your kind of management planning. And then kind of looking at the invasives that are there and how you can use, you know, there's a number of tools at our disposal and grazing animals are a great tool when used appropriately. And, you know, it, it, in most cases, they're not going to be there all the time. They're going to be used uh, as impulses to kind of get a particular job done at a particular moment when things are in flower when their seeds are about to, you know, be able to reproduce, you want to come in and, you know, minimize their ability to reproduce, essentially. So there's particular kind of timing elements to that. I'm particularly interested in the kind of intersection of fire and grazing and how we can kind of do both of those or, you know, kind of in areas where fire might not be applicable using grazing animals to kind of uh, approximate those same kinds of results. So I think, and then there's also, you know, physical, mechanical management, mowing, things like that, that can work on a bigger scale. They don't really, you know, it's harder. But I do think there's also, you know, a conversation that I like to have is imagining people on a broader scale, having more of a relationship with the land around them and thinking about what that could be like if we kind of, you know, quarterly or whatever, had people out like managing lands that they care about and just doing something and participating. And I don't necessarily advocate pulling out Scotch Room because I don't think that that actually works, <laughs> but figuring out how we can plan things so that we're participating in the the thriving of the species that we'd like to see there. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about the way that we arrange our time and economy and culture and kids and stuff like that. You know, we just don't interact with land at all. It's true. hardly. And they're all <laughs> interconnected, all of those things that you just mentioned and beyond. Like it's an element in how we find ourselves in the ecological and societal situ situation that we are in, right? Um, they're not separate and they're not going to be solved by attacking only one element of them or making small selective changes and hoping that the whole thing's going to, you know, evolve into 
this idea of wilderness or wildness or health or ecological prosperity that we might have in our minds without making changes in the others. Now, to, to build on that and maybe to use some specific examples, I would love to share about what advice you would give to listeners and later myself on building a deeper understanding and relationship with the members of our local ecosystems and how to advocate for more effective and compassionate management of full and healthy ecologies rather than eradication or control of a single species. And maybe we can do this through a tangible example that I can provide for you myself. So on my small farm and homestead here in central Catalonia, I have been making an effort to work with the forestry technicians of the natural park that our land borders, partly because they have jurisdiction over the river that runs right through the middle of my property. And they have been working on ecological projects along the riparian zone for quite some time. And they had recently come up for a new round of funding that they received from the government to do these things. And they put out proposals there. They even invited me to give my own proposal, which is currently in review. And fingers crossed that I get some permission here. But one of the things that they've been doing for a number of years now and have proposed to continue is to eradicate black locusts along the shores of the river in the riparian zone. And the argument here is that it is interfering with the reestablishment specifically of black alder. Alnus glutinosa, right? The, the one that they're really trying to favor in this area for very good reasons. It has a lot of ecological benefits. It has been here for a very long time. And in areas that have been disturbed, either through recent floods, such as one back in 2020, which really wrecked a lot of the areas along the side of the river, naturally in areas where there was not sufficient vegetation in the riparian zone because the farming had gotten too close and encroached on that area, the first thing that grows back and takes over very fast is black locust, Robinia pseudocassia, for anybody who doesn't know the colloquial term. How would you propose, first of all, communicating with these authorities and these management agencies to propose different ways of considering a relationship with those as well as the benefits that they could have? And maybe giving examples or participating in that process so that it's not something that you just outsource to somebody else, but rather put some skin in the game yourself. How would you start with a, with a challenge like this? That's a great question and an interesting example. I work a lot with Black Locust on my farm as well. I'm personally but... a fan. I have done a lot of research on it. I could wax poetic for a long time about the. <laughs> numerous benefits of this species, but I would love to hear it from you. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you have a unique opportunity to, and it sounds like a good working relationship, which is important. And, you know, we've done a lot of work to kind of develop those kinds of relationships with similar agencies around where we live. And I think, you know, being able to do like even small test plots of, you know, I'm not sure if you have animals there, but our sheep love black locust and they, you know, if you are interested in kind of managing it and, and coppicing it, like keeping it low, they could do a nice job with that. But, you know, I think saying like, hey, we should consider, I'm not sure how big the watershed is, but taking a whole watershed approach to this. And, you know, ideally, like we say in, in permaculture design, if you can, the highest you can work up and start your project up the watershed, the better, because, you know, if you're working really low down, you're not really going to see, you know, the results as easily. And you're not necessarily going to be able to affect as much in terms of like leverage points. So if you are able to kind of partner with that agency and work up to kind of expand the riparian buffer, maybe mitigate some of those pulses of flood water with check dams things like that that are kind of addressing you know the scouring and release of sediment that's just going away and you know that kind of creates the conditions that black locust loves <laughs> that might be something to consider as well but yeah i think there's a lot of have you tried anything like that or is that like a reasonable 
<laughs> well, I'm smiling in the background here because I know this is such good validation for me knowing that I'm not far off. Particularly the action that I proposed in that in that budget review is to put in some check dams and induced meandering in the stream, which has been severely uh, channelized, partly due to poor management upstream, long histories of having it dammed inappropriately for uses of things like water mills, which my house is an old water mill, and they recently took out the dam back in 2017, which, well, one of the many symptoms that came from that was a massive flow of sediment downstream which they later excavated out with machinery, which was interesting. And also about a meter and a half drop in the average water levels, which <laughs> given that they're trying to favor uh, the Alnes glutinosa, the alder trees, then disconnected their root systems, which need to be wet and caused a massive die off of those trees, making the conditions perfect for <laughs> the black locust, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying here? So yes, this is exactly the approach that I'm trying to take. And I have done a lot of research recently about, you know, where the sources of that stream are, the actors in the yeah. area that benefits from or that manage the land that is connected to it, and what it means for the rest of the river system downstream as it connects as a tributary into the larger river Ter, which is the, the important artery of our region. And mm. I'm still kind of putting it all together in a way that I can communicate it cohesively, but I already have been fetching some contacts from the region that I would like to propose making a presentation or having a conversation with who have been involved with NGO efforts to reestablish the, the alders and you know other types of works in the watershed of the region. And given that we are currently experiencing the most severe drought in history, and everyone is talking about water management in this region anyway, I see the time being ripe to maybe try and propose some new solutions as to how we can have a beneficial relationship with the tools available to us currently, rather than fighting the ones that are trying to accomplish the same goals as we are. Yeah, that sounds great. And, you know, one thing that's interesting about Black Locust, if you do end up doing a big check dam project, is that it's a really hard and long-lasting wood. It's perfect exactly. for check dam. <laughs> well, and they know this. They've actually used it for erosion control in other areas. It's like they're not unaware of the benefits, but I think for a long enough period, it has been classified as an invasive species. And so the only way that they can deal with it or get the funding proposals that they want is through eradication. And, and well, what they're doing now is poisoning the trees. Yeah. I mean, do people have, have sheep in the area? It seems like they're probably common there are a couple. we have a neighbor that just keeps sheep just on their own land and it's something that we would definitely like to incorporate into our farm strategy as we move forward it's you know building up a new farm i'm sure you're aware of it's not a quick process especially with two people. but yeah. it's definitely something i would like to propose and is a perfect segue into so many other things that these park services and these funding agencies are trying to promote which is rural revival ecological economic drivers and i think it would be very easy to at least make proposals about how these things could be linked through proper cultural management of the species that are currently present rather than wasting money every year on fruitless eradication efforts yeah i mean there's so much that could be done regeneration wise if you can get those funds redirected and you know we've had some success like with I mentioned kind of at the beginning maybe before we started recording but we have worked with like in our area they're called watershed councils mm -hmm. and we're quite a bit with the natural resource conservation service in kind of setting up these unique test cases because one of the things that you know many agencies kind of rely on is peer-reviewed research and an issue with invasive species management is there's not a lot of peer-reviewed research on doing anything besides spraying them. Right. So if you can kind of take that angle and say, hey, we're going to set up, you know, some test cases here, get some funding, you know, set up some plots, do some basic data management and say, you know, <clears throat> we brought the sheep in here six times this year and this is the result. It's not necessarily going to be a quick fix, but it does meet all of these other 
interest, more interesting criteria, like you're saying of, you know, keeping rural economies going like, and, and farm economies, like if people have sheep and you're in a drought and they need forage, there's all of this black locust growing in the riparian area, like put them over there. And as at the same time, as you're trying to, you know, lift the, the channel and reconnect the floodplain, create the conditions for the, the alder, you know, it's kind of a long-term trajectory because we're kind of at the tail end of, I think, starting to to realize how some of these past historic management decisions are leading to this kind of degradation, especially in riparian areas. And mm. that's going to take a while to deal with and, and bring it back, you know, unless further desertification is, is kind of the, the end result of not doing anything. Absolutely. I think you made some really good points there that I am considering, but I just haven't had time to work on. But uh, water councils, like you said, is something that I'm very interested in trying to either join on to if they already exist or help to get started in this area. And I really believe that a collaborative effort towards these types of things is essential because you can't really do anything in an ecology in isolation with all of these things connected. You might have success on an individual project that then butts up against how someone else is managing their land and causes an antagonistic relationship. And the more we can communicate and get people involved who have a stake in the well-being of these things, the more we can, you know, look for for support from outside and have a unified vision that we can communicate for people to be able to participate on rather than individual outcomes that we might want which are not part of a cohesive land management plan in which everyone can buy into. And, you know, it's, it, my uphill battle is that I still need to learn Catalan. <laughs> I can get by just fine on Spanish, but it's a real cultural <laughs> unifier here is, is the local language. And yeah, I, I hope over time to continue to make the relationships that are necessary to build the relationships with the ecology that I would like to see in this area. That's so cool. That's really, I look forward to hearing the progress <laughs> maybe yeah, something I'll visiting some... with you. I, i'm sure i will reach out to you again for advice and troubleshooting as this journey continues i really appreciate not only all of the incredible insights and examples that you've put into your book but the continued communication and work that you do to promote a more inclusive and empathetic way of managing our ecologies with these very quickly changing times and you know, a, a new vision of how we can interact and form our cultures around beneficial relationships with all of the forms of life that that we interact with. Uh, I really want to thank you for that. And I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much. It was so great to chat with you. Well, real quick, before we go, can you share with our listeners how they can get in touch with you and find out more about your work and your book? Sure. Probably the easiest way is through my website, www.resiliencepermaculture.com. That has all of our social media stuff on there. But yeah, we do classes and workshops from time to time in Oregon and elsewhere and online too. I also work at the Oregon State <clears throat> University Permaculture Program. And at, we work with folks all over the world. And yeah, <clears throat> we're kind of getting out and about more often we're thinking about um, maybe going to europe next year so <laughs> oh please let me know if you're in this area i would love to host you here and show you a little bit what we're working on wonderful that would be fun <laughs> well again thanks so much for your time and i look forward to being in touch yeah thank you have a good day thanks once again to dow i've put the link to where you can get a copy of her book at chelsea green publishing and the links to her business and consultancy in the show notes on the website at regenerativeskills.com. Now, before we wrap this up, just remember that these episodes are only the beginning of the learning resources, design and coaching services, in-person courses, and interactive community that are available through Regenerative Skills. The Discord server is our free community where you can connect with other like-minded listeners, exchange ideas, stories, tips, and resources, as well as interact with me directly and quite a few former guests from this show. Our Instagram account, at regen underscore skills, is the best place to see the projects that me and the team are working on, both for clients and collaborators, as well as on our own properties. I'll also be announcing the certification courses, workshops, and gatherings that we've got coming up later this year. If you're interested in getting dedicated support for your own project, 
You can now schedule a free planning session with one of our team members through the request form on our website. You can also find all the links, show notes, and past resources there at regenerativeskills.com. We truly believe that no matter your experience, your knowledge, abilities, resources, or background, you can be a powerful force for regeneration on this planet, and we're here to help you find your path. So as always, remember to keep taking those little steps every day towards a regenerative future, and I'll be right by your side along the way.